Hi, I'm Mark Davis. I'm a naturopathic doctor here at Capital Integrative Health. I work almost entirely with people with digestive diseases and autoimmune diseases, especially patients with inflammatory bowel disease. I'm here to talk about a topic that is fascinating to me called helminthic therapy. So when somebody says, I have intestinal parasites, they're either talking about protozoans, which are little single-cell microorganisms that are harmless in many people but harmful in some people, or they're talking about helminths. Helminths are little, often microscopic, worm-like organisms that are native to wild humans all over the place, that is pre-industrial human communities, uh, and wild mammals and wild vertebrates. So really every type of vertebrate, every fish, every reptile, every mammal of any kind, typically is more likely to have helminths living in them than not. It's just industrialized humans and our pets and our cattle that are less likely to have helminths. One way that helminths have learned to survive in the human GI tract without our immune systems destroying them is through increasing something called T regulatory cells. This is a part of your immune system that tells the other parts of the immune system, it's okay, our job is done, we can relax here. No need to keep attacking. This is true even for the helminths that are really bad guys. So, so about one out of five people on the planet has one or more helminths living in them. And some of these are real bad guys. Elephantiasis, like the elephant man, that's caused by a bad helminth. Uh, there's something called river blindness that makes many, many kids every year get vision impaired or blind. Uh, that's caused by a helminth. So some of them are very bad and cause harm, and some of them are pretty benign and don't really cause significant harm, especially at low levels. But one thing that even the bad ones have in common is they survive in our gut by increasing T regulatory activity. In these days, in industrialized countries, most people are not suffering from harms through helminths or other gut parasites, but many people are suffering from diseases where the problem is that their immune system is too active. It's hyperactive and it's causing them problems. It seems that for some of those people, restoring helminths to their gut is able to restore normal levels of immunity and, uh, and uh, to stop their hyperinflammatory processes. This could be any hyperinflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, environmental allergens, food allergens, multiple sclerosis, celiac disease, lupus. These are all hyperinflammatory conditions. The research really started about 15 or 20 years ago when people doing good work in public health did big anti-helminthic programs in places like Uganda and Gabon and Thailand. And it was good to eliminate these helmets that were causing harms like elephantiasis and river blindness. But what they noticed was in these populations, more kids were getting eczema, atopic dermatitis, and people who got skin prick tests were more likely to be reactive to dust mites and other signs of hyper reactivity in these populations. So as scientists started to get some of these ideas, an interesting thing happened in Argentina. So around the turn of the century, uh, there was a bit, there were a series of big economic crashes in Argentina. And at one point in Buenos Aires, it was, uh, there was enough financial challenge that the government was no longer keeping uh, sewage water out of the drinking water as reliably. And this one neurologist there, uh, Dr. Coriol, uh, noticed that his patients were showing up with blood markers showing that they had some of these helminths in their gut, most likely. But he was aware of this research from Gabon and Uganda and other places and said, hold on, for, for in particular for his patients with multiple sclerosis, he said, what if we just don't treat these helminths? Because you have a hyperactive immune system and maybe these helminths could help. So he uh, offered this to a lot of patients, and a, a dozen or two of them said, okay, let's not get rid of the helmets. And the rest of his patients said, no, I want to get rid of the helmets. And he followed these two different groups for, for about five years, and he tracked 
the number of new and enlarging lesions in their brain, and he tracked them using a standard measure for multiple sclerosis called the Extended Disability Status Scale. And he tracked how many flares they had each year over the years. And what he found is the patients without helmets had gradual increases in their disability, more new and enlarging lesions and flares, and the group who had helmets had almost no new flares, almost no new and enlarging lesions, and very little change in the extended disability status scale over this course of five years. So that wasn't an intentional intervention, but and it wasn't a randomized trial, but it was a trial comparing two different groups. The other trial that is most interesting is a uh, uh, trial from Australia, Dr. Um, Croacy, I think is how you say his name, who uh, took patient, patients with celiac disease and gave them my favorite helmet, Nicator Americanus, uh, one that I've used with dozens of patients. I've given it to myself twice just to show how safe I believe it is. I've used it with family members. Um, so he, uh, in this Australian trial, they gave 10 of these Nicator Americanus microscopic larvae to the patients. Um, and then another 10 a month later. And these were all patients with proven celiac disease who had reacted very badly to the exposure to gluten in the past. And then the researchers gave them tiny microscopic micrograms of gluten. And they escalated the doses and increased them and increased them until after a few months, each of, uh, well, eight out of 11 of these celiac patients were literally eating a bowl of spaghetti a day. They didn't have any rise in their uh, serum markers for celiac disease. They were doing capsule endoscopy. They didn't see any changes in their villus height to crypt depth ratio, which is the gold standard of assessing celiac activity. And they gave them celiac specific quality of life surveys and it showed their quality of life just went up and up. Whereas normally with exposure to gluten, their quality of life would really decline. Um, so this is the only thing humans have ever studied that can relatively reliably allow people with celiac disease to tolerate gluten without getting inflamed. And it hasn't been formally studied for people with other food sensitivities, but I've seen patients with other food sensitivities improve as well. I wanted to share one case study, which is a gentleman I worked with who had celiac disease and something called ankylosing spondylitis. This is an autoimmune disease where your immune system causes so much inflammation in your spine that the vertebrae fuse to each other uh, until when it's at its worst, you have what's called a bamboo spine, a completely solid stretch of vertebrae that can't bend at all. Pain and lack of mobility are the two big signs for ankylosing spondylitis, uh, although you can identify it on x-ray as well. So this patient noticed that if he ate gluten, he would have digestive problems and he would go into an ankylosing spondylitis flare and eventually had to increase. So he not only was eating a zero gluten diet, but he was eating a zero grain diet that was low in carbohydrates of all kinds, even non-grain carbohydrates. Even while on this low carbohydrate, no grain, gluten-free diet, he would have two or three or four flares of ankylosing spondylitis per year that would leave him in bed, unable to work his job as a carpenter or do much of uh, any other things for a couple of weeks at a time. So this was a big drain on his quality of life. We gave him an initial dose of 10 Nicator Americanus larvae uh, and then another redose. And just like in the study, started gradually reintroducing gluten. We didn't weigh out micrograms like they did in the study, but he would just have crumb of this, a little bit of that, and started gradually, gradually introducing, reintroducing the doses. I followed him for about three years after that. It's been about five years since I treated him. And for that entire three-year period, he found his quality of life getting better and better. And uh, it has been years since he's had an ankylosing spondylitis flare. And he can consume gluten now if he wants. Uh, he doesn't go crazy with it all the time, but if he feels like having a sandwich or drinking a beer he does with apparently no consequences. Uh, his inflammatory markers didn't go up for the time I followed him, and his symptoms, well, he just had zero flares of uh, digestive disturbance or his back pain or lack of mobility. So I've used helmets with many patients. I think everybody with 
Celiac disease and everybody with multiple sclerosis should be curious about what these little microorganisms can do for them. And I think everybody with an autoimmune or hyperinflammatory condition might want to consider what it would be like to reintroduce one of these organisms that's used therapeutically into their gut ecosystem.